Greetings, Miskatonic Repository. Heinrich Mohr here. And today we will be doing what is sometimes known as a table read. A table read is a combo actual play review and commentary track. You can also think about it as a scenario speedrun. It's a great tool, whether you're a solo writer or an editor, to help develop the structure of a scenario and identify the interesting decisions investigators will need to make. We don't know whether it will actually be an interesting tool to listen to, hence why we are testing this format on one of my scenarios on drive through RPG The Great Trap, a scenario that features parallel timelines, a D&D like dungeon layout, chase scenes, and some deadly deadly traps. It's a scenario that takes some big swings, and our goal is going to see whether those swings pay off by providing a summary playthrough of the scenario, talking about what's interesting from a design standpoint, and providing our general reactions to the scenario. With that ambitious agenda set forth, let's dive in by introducing our table readers, Evan Perlman and Leslie Horn. Evan, please take it away. I am Evan. I am a writer and community project organizer on the Miskatonic Repository. Um, I have done recently uh, some things you may have seen, including In Strange Seas, which is Regency Royal Navy versus the Mythos. I um, have also done a scenario called Dream House, which is available as a cool um like double book like reverse printed i don't know how to describe it with with john hook one of john hook scenarios because they're both sequels to the haunting um have done a number of other projects there as well and i hang out around the facebook miskatonic repository creative circle and the symphony uh, entertainment discord excellent if you're looking to shoot cannons at cthulhu evan is your man to look up <laughs> leslie how about yourself Yes, my name is Leslie Horn, or if you see me around the internet, XP Love Cat. I have um, a couple of YouTube channels, one on fiction writing and one on tabletop role-playing games. I am a freelance developmental editor um, who edits for fiction, but also role-playing games. I've done a lot on the Miskatonic Repository, helping uh, creators get their scenarios to the finish line. Um, one that I edited just won an any a couple weeks ago, which is an amazing, uh, The Well of All Fear, written by Cat Clay, won an any, so that's really exciting. Um, yeah, and that's me. So let's talk about your characters. Let's figure out who you chose, uh, because this scenario comes with a number of pregens. Um, Evan, who are you playing today? My first choice, and Leslie, tell me if we need to fight about it, is Spencer Raceland. Uh, he's a book dealer uh, who lives in Chicago, but is from Edinburgh in the UK, in Scotland. I'm not going to do a Scottish accent. I don't need to be killed. Um, I picked him because I tend to, when I pick a, a pre-gen, I tend to look for sort of off-book skills that they have. Um, and while he's a book dealer and has some of the expected skills, he also has 50% in Intimidate and 40% in Fighting Brawl. Uh, and 50% in sleight of hand. And so this strikes me as uh, a book dealer in the way that someone might be a heroin dealer. Um, and I really appreciate him getting into a lot of trouble, um, you know, forcibly moving books around in the market. Terrific. Uh, Leslie, so we know Evan's playing Spencer. Uh, who are you choosing today? Yes, I chose Dr. A Ling Song. Um, and she is from the Republic of China. Unlike Evan, who looks at the skills, I don't usually look at the skills at all. I just pick pick based on backstory because I like to be able to role play based on whatever their background is. Um, so for her in particular, the first line here is, your parents hoped you would marry rich. They are far less impressed that you are one of the preeminent astrophysicists to come out of the Republic of China which is hilarious. I, lo I love that this person came up from a family where they have very different views on what is successful. And I can get a lot from her personality just from that first line. Good to have you, Dr. Song. So something that's a little different about um, these pregens from other pregens was uh, something called special abilities. Evan, do you mind uh, telling us about what your special ability is? Uh, so Spencer knows a version of the spell called Shriveling, uh, which basically causes the target to suffer a terrifying blast of energy, causes their flesh to blacken and wither. All right, so keep that in mind in your uh, bag of tricks that you will have available. Uh, Dr. Song. <laughs> yes, yeah, so once per scenario, 
I can consult my journal of radio signals for the answer to a particular question, and in doing so, automatically succeed on a skill roll of any difficulty for any intellect-based skill roll, including Cthulhu Mythos, which is super exciting. Let's talk about the hook for the scenario. Um, so the scenario is going to begin with your characters receiving uh, a letter from a physicist known as Adamor Osterman. What is curious about this letter is that although our scenario takes place in 1927, the letter itself is dated 1897. What is also strange about this uh, letter is that each of you has signed it in a signature that you recognize as your own. The letter invites you to meet with Dr. Osterman at his residence in Chicago. In addition to this letter, you each will have a dream. Uh, you're going to dream of a, a portal and a guardian, a guardian shrouded in, in, a, in a robe. And they are going to give you an option of whether or not to go through that portal or not. And they're going to introduce themselves at, as Uma at Tawil, the prolonged of life. And they will ask if you bear the silver key. As they ask this, you will remember that letter that uh, you received with your signature, and you will recall yourself signing it, or at least some version of yourself. And when you look through the gate, you are going to see some tragedy that did not happen, but that might have. So Spencer, what for you would have been this kind of nightmare vision so uh, five or six years ago, I thought it would be a good idea to get a cat for the store. Um, you know, we had we found little hamsters and things chewing the pages um, and didn't want that. And the cat worked out for about a week uh, until it knocked over a candle. Um, and fortunately, I happened to be watching at the time, um, so I was able to snuff it out. But if I had been with a customer at the front of the store, or if I'd been out, um, that could easily have, have destroyed the store, possibly caused great harm. Um, to myself, and, and the, the cat would have been fine. He would have run out. Uh, Leslie, what about Dr. Song? During her time, her time studying astro astrophysicist, um, she met a man who wanted to date her and court her, and he was very wealthy. Um, at the time, my parents had influenced me to try and date him, and I decided it was not going to work out, and I didn't want to do that, so I did not go on a date. However, in this version, we did go on a date, and it ended um, in a terrible situation in which um, he got very drunk and drove home and got in a car accident. Well, good I'm thing right. that that did not happen. Uh, but we can imagine the headlights of the vehicle kind of coming at the portal um, as you look through it. In game mechanics terms, at this point you would lose D3 sanity, you would gain five luck points, right? And you would have had the option of sort of embracing this vision going through it or stepping away from it. And depending on which you chose, you would either get that luck or you wouldn't. But more importantly, from our standpoint or from the Keeper's standpoint, I should say, we now have something terrible in your character's background that we have in our back pockets and we will be able to use it later in the scenario potentially depending on how the character dies depending on if they have uh, any particular vision this is something that now is in the player's minds that they will be able to draw from and that the keeper will be able to draw from so we are planting some seeds as we uh, as we go presumably you will go to meet um, Adamar Osterman and uh, when you do, you will find him to be a rather stiff uh, professor type individual um, whose house is uh, nicely furnished, but filled with um, rather curious arcane lore books, as well as strange samples of rock. And you'll notice also that um, all of his physics books, the thing that he is an expert in, are sort of neatly piled in a corner. And, and he will know nothing about the letter. I would ask about the dream and, mm -hmm. and see and see if anyone else has encountered something like this because it's something odd. Well, he will find that curious because his field of research, his current field of research, is uh, in fact having to do with studying um, what he calls time waves. 
So just like we can measure um, uh, light as, as waves and particles, so he believes that there are streams of time that can be measured. And he actually had a device that he constructed for that purpose. It is uh, fortunate, in a sense, that you have come on this day because this device has just been stolen. Okay. All right. Now we've got a mystery on our hands. Now you've got a hook. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now we're in. So, so we would start, you know, asking about about the theft and looking for for leads. And did he see anything? Does he have any enemies? Have people been, you know, any deliveries? Like, oh, hey, what's that you got in the back there, Professor? You know, that kind of thing. Yeah, and, and he'll show you his basement, and. Um, it's not super dusty, right? But but anything that has stood uh, in one place for a while is going to sort of leave an outline, right? And you can see where, as he describes it, this sort of pyramidal um, device that he constructed would have stood at the center of the room. And sure enough, like it's gone. And it was not a small device. It was probably like five feet tall, maybe a hundred kilograms. So not something that you're easily going to be able to put in your back pocket. Evan, uh, you mentioned that Spencer might be asking about any enemies that uh, Adama Osterman has. And he will tell you about a rival physicist known as Walter Kreutz. And so Osterman is going to tell you that, um, you know, that that's as close to a rival as he has this Walter Kreutz, who uh, works and resides out of um, a uh, observatory that uh, that his family constructed um, that is uh, near Lake Geneva, sort of a few hours away. And he will he will ask whether as sort of a neutral third party, uh, you would be willing to go to uh, the Kreutz Observatory and uh, talk with him and see if there's any indication that maybe he is involved with the disappearance, Osterman thinks, theft of this device. As you uh, begin broaching that subject, Osterman is going to break into a seizure. His eyes uh, roll back there. He begins to sort of kind of moan involuntarily. He falls to the ground and there is going to be a purplish gas that escapes from his mouth right after he goes rigid. Rigor mortis still, except he's still breathing. His eyes are open. He just seems completely frozen. Um, first aid. Um, I do have some first aid, so I would probably I would go over and try and help. I'm not really a scientist, but do I recognize either via natural world or occult? Do I? Does this purple gas mean anything to me, or does it have a smell, perhaps? Mm, yeah. So with with Spencer's a particular occult knowledge, what I think would come to his mind is that. Um, whatever was animating Osterman, some might call it a soul, uh, some might call it something else, a spirit perhaps, um, you're wondering whether that's what was exuded from him. Is it, um, has it dissipated or it has, could I like yes. grab a jar? No, oh, no, you can't. Right. Yeah, it's jar. <laughs> Osterman soul jarred. Um, <laughs> no, so, so. Just, you hate to waste it. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that's going to be uh, gone. Um, it'll have dissipated. Presumably, you will um, head to the observatory to still carry out Osterman's last wish before uh, he went yeah. into a coma. Yes. I, I, we, we are good players. We would, we would take the bait. We pick things up uh, with you traveling by car to uh, the Kreutz Observatory. Now, as you drive, uh, you're maybe... A mile away, there is uh, woods on either side, um, and you're going to hear an explosion in the distance, what we would sort of take as a kind of sonic boom. And you will see a shockwave that actually comes towards you and passes through you. Now, you would need to make some driving checks because the vehicle turns itself off. 
any electricity in it, uh, its motor ceases to function. Uh, the car spins out of control. There's an opportunity where uh, things might go quite bad if you if you meet uh, the wrong side of a tree. Um, but if you make your driving roll right, you're sort of just prone um, in your vehicle um, in the street. But what is uh, curious is as your car is spinning, you are going to have a chance to see things in the woods around you, specifically yourselves. So you will see yourselves looking at you spinning in this car. We're not going to figure out whether, you know, the car crash is bad or not. Suffice to say, the car is inoperable and you'd probably have to walk the rest of the way. Maybe you could fix it if you had the right skills, um, but otherwise you are arriving at the Kreutz Observatory on foot. It's on sort of a mound, a uh, grassy knoll, if you will, so forest all around it, but a nice big clear area. And as you approach the observatory, um, there is going to be a, another sound behind you. Can we take a moment to be distracted by the multiples of ourselves in the woods? Yeah. What? I, okay, I, I was going to move they're... past that. Because they're gone. By the time the car stops spinning, they're gone. <laughs> oh. It's all fine. Okay. I didn't know if they were like standing there like ready to help out with the car or anything. But... No, it doesn't seem that way. They, they really seem to just be watching, not not helping you. Um, it sounds like me. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, would, you would have a chance to sort of uh, make some roles to realize that um, they were you, uh, but they did look a little different. So things like different articles of clothing, for example, from what you're currently wearing. Walking to the observatory, you would come to the observatory, you would see it in front of you. There's a very large dome, there's a long building connecting to it, and then there's a couple of smaller uh, domes um, at the end of that. I'll provide a map shortly. But what's curious uh, about this as you um, arrive at the observatory is that one of the domes, one of the smaller domes, right, there's the big dome and then there's two smaller domes. One of the smaller domes, um, the top is, is gone. It looks like it was destroyed. Your realization of this is then interrupted by the sound of a car coming up behind you. And it is uh, your car and you are driving in it. I think um, I would wait patiently to see if they get out of the car and, and if I can speak to them. Okay, so you're, you're going to wait where you are. Spencer, what about you? Yeah, I mean, I think we've already established that I, I wouldn't help so <laughs> fair enough. Wait. <laughs> well, uh, it's probably a good thing that you didn't get any closer to the car because it stops, it parks, um, and then it crumples. It is oh. smashed as though a great weight just fell on top of the car. And this is kind of a gross scene, like blood squirts out of the windows, right? Because it's just a can getting smashed uh, down. Um, and then you will hear a... Uh, a whistling sound. Where is the whistling coming from? From the car, or what's left okay. of it. Um, this is very concerning. So, in theory, we're, lo we're losing some oh, sanity. Oh yeah, you're making some sanity yeah. rolls, right? Potentially you're going uh, temporarily insane. I sort of yeah. leave that up to you, whether you think it's appropriate or not. Uh, I, yeah, I think it's appropriate for my character at this point. I, I at least um, am not able to act for some amount of time because that was just, that was a lot. <laughs> Alright, so Dr. Sung is kind of paralyzed. Yeah. What about you, Spencer? I mean, realistically, I think I'd probably fail a sand roll here, um, you know. But I, but I think I think investigation is is going to carry him through here. The the need to find out more. He's both horrified and and attracted to this, um, given his backing in in the occult. So he's going to go gingerly, like literally grabbing a stick, and like holding it out in front of him in case something crushes the stick. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, um, so, Dr. Sung, you would watch uh, Spencer Raceland get closer to the car. You're still paralyzed, uh, but you would come out of your paralysis when, and we would do some rolls for this, uh, but almost certainly Spencer would get uh, devoured. His uh, body would just disappear other than flecks of blood <laughs> and the sound of, like, gnashing teeth. And yeah, uh, Doctor Song, you would see the right, only I'm thing. I'm gonna pick another character. <laughs> <laughs> the yeah. only only evidence uh, of of what might be doing this is a um, three toed uh, footprint um, 
indenture in the grass. Uh, and it's quite large. It's like a yard across. And there'll be that whistling again. Okay. Um, I'm not going near that that scene. Um, I don't want to be devoured. Um, so at this point, my character likely would run towards um, the building yep. and try and find another living being. So at this point, we would uh, go into a chase scene. And the scenario comes with these um, cards. They have uh, pictures of the observatory. You can see some of them uh, in the table read document. And essentially, each image is a location. So as you get closer, the image of the observatory gets bigger and bigger. Right? You can imagine yourself like running uh, towards it. We're going to say that Dr. Sung makes it. And as soon as she gets into the building, right, slams the door shut, hears the whistling sound outside, the thing is clearly still there. Uh, but also here in the foyer is Spencer Raislin. Because as soon as Spencer uh, perished, his player would have gotten a randomized, uh, what I call sort of death card, uh, what others might call a parallel life card. And these would range from everything from um, you're yourself, just slightly different. So you might have a different haircut, you might have a different cut of beard, different clothing choices, to you come from a parallel universe in which the central powers won World War I, right? Or a socialist revolution swept the world. It would entirely depend on which card you got. And it would in some way allow you to remake your character. Spencer, uh, what would Dr. Sung see as she came into uh, the observatory and saw you there and who are you now yeah so so channeling um what i assume most players who have any familiarity with parallel universes are going to do um, he looks exactly the same but he has a goatee mm. uh, and sort of a sinister look you would have some confused exchanges at this point and you would find many similarities between your lives um Spencer's recollection would essentially be that he did what Dr. Sung did, which was run the heck away mm. and into the building. He just happened to make it before Dr. Sung, and she has caught up uh, from his standpoint. So that's not nothing terribly weird uh, for him, but very strange for Dr. Sung. Yes, I would definitely explain to Spencer what I witnessed. Um, and yes, there would be some confusing conversation but then I imagine we'd both be like, all right, well, we got a task, so you're the Spencer now, let's go. Yeah. So at this point, we would go into sort of the um, the D, D homage, if you will, the Dungeons and Dragons uh, dungeon crawl aspect, except instead of a dungeon, we have an observatory. And so if you check your table read document, um, almost at the end of it, there is a map of the Kreutz Observatory, which we would uh, provide you at this point. Possibly you already would have this if you had done research on the observatory, for example, but you would find yourself in the entrance hall. And this would be a very ornate space. Uh, you can see that it has um, uh, not counting the front door, which is closed, though you can still hear the whistling on the other side. Um, it's got a few uh, doors that go off. There would also be a large portrait um, that showed uh, Walter Kreutz and someone else. And the uh, portrait would identify it in the description as Ursula Kreutz, presumably his sister based on, on the age between them. Um, and uh, you would see that each of them had a necklace with a silver key. Uh, and at this point, I would turn things back over to you to explore. I think um, I, with the intention of trying to find this person, I would probably hit up the laboratory first. So going through the East Hall, then mm -hmm. going to the laboratory and seeing where that got us until we are able to find signs of life somewhere. Yeah. Spencer, does that work for you? Yeah, absolutely. So possibly right before going into the East Hall and opening those doors, you would uh, have perhaps succeeded at a listen roll to hear the sound of some kind of party on the other side. So people mm. mingling, chatting, and uh, when you open up the door, a room full or hall full of people dressed in clothing that, um, yeah, is about 30 years out of date, uh, would sort of shout, uh, surprise or congratulations, and there would be a big banner that uh, 
celebrate the inaugural opening of the Kreutz Observatory. And there would be people mingling, there would be waiters um, passing around beverages, um, and, you know, like 30 or 40 people here. Do they seem surprised to see us? Um, they, they seem excited to see you. Then, uh, because it doesn't appear as though you were the people they were expecting, they kind of reset, right? They kind of go back <laughs> okay. to what they were doing, like, oh, okay, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, so I would poke around, you know, see if, if uh, you know, ask the sort of naive questions. Hey, did you guys hear that giant explosion a few minutes mm. ago? Um, you know, look for anyone that I recognize. Do they know um, Kreutz or, or uh, Osterman? Mm. Try well, to work in some current events, maybe, like ask them about current events to get a oh, sense yeah, of the year yeah, yeah. without being like, what year is it? <laughs> well, the year is displayed on the banner. And as far as they're oh, concerned, there yeah, we are about 30 years um, in the past. And okay, um, I mean, folks are a little perturbed by your by your attire. Right? Not entirely appropriate for a formal party like this. Um, it, it's a big deal. Uh, folks are hoping that they will get to see Walter, um, or at least his uh, sister Ursula, who, um, you know, some of them think is sort of the smarter one anyway. Um, but uh, Dr. Sung, what you will notice as you are talking with folks is the conversations are very repetitive. Folks seem to be able to carry on eh, maybe two minutes worth of conversation. After that, they will reintroduce themselves to you and ask who you are, even though you have already identified who you are. Uh, the key or the solution to this mystery, uh, Spencer may uh, discover by um, searching sort of the outsides of the room and finding that there are a series of projectors set up. Now, these projectors are not functioning quite in the way that uh, you would expect, um, but they seem to be recreating a point in time. And as, for example, Spencer would uh, interpose something in front of these projectors, such that uh, some of the light would be blocked, for example, um, you would have the horrifying sight of actually seeing some of these people kind of split in half. Like you would see, you know, just a part of their body and you would see muscle and bone. Uh, they wouldn't be perturbed by this. They would just uh, continue and people would walk in and out of existence. Okay. Um, maybe some sort of um, mechanical role, like something for investigation on these projectors is where I would go next. Yeah, you would you would be able to uh, turn them off if you wanted. Do I want to do that? That's a fine question. Spencer, what, uh, what would you be doing while uh, Dr. Sung is working on this? Yeah. Uh, so if we were in the East Hall, um, the laboratory probably doesn't have a lot of books in it, but the storage rooms might. So I will I will drift over to the storage room, keeping an ear out for the sounds of screaming or squishing or exploding or whistling. Fair enough. Uh, the storage room is going to be overflowing with scrap metal, wires, tubing. Um, oh. If you uh, succeeded on, say, mechanical repair or electrical repair role, there would actually be an opportunity for you to put together a weapon based on schematics that you found here um, that, uh, out of character, right, we would recognize as a lightning gun. Okay. So we will cool. say for purposes of this playthrough that that's something that uh, Spencer is able to do. So you have another uh, item in your, in your uh, toolbox, if you will. Uh, meanwhile, Dr. Sung. Um, um, I'm yeah. going to leave the projectors on. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't want to mess with whatever is happening here. And at least there's no squishing going on in the hall. So we're OK there. And then I would head towards the laboratory. OK. So in the laboratory, uh, you would find um, what at first glance appears to be a morgue. So there's hatches along one wall uh, that you um, recognize belatedly as a furnaces uh, for uh, scientific experimentation. There's also a deep freezer. Um, and then there are uh, shelves of, um, well, scientific ingredients, but they all have uh, the alchemical names for them on them. Um, so it, it, it is this combination of very modern scientific equipment for the 1920s, um, but at the same time, uh, all the uh, actual substances um, seem, seem archaic. And uh, there would be a number of uh, possible 
goals that you could um, accomplish here, but uh, you're going to find a couple of things, uh, Dr. Song. You will find a silver box, a silver box that um, has on it, you're not quite sure what trick of light is producing this, but there are a series of symbols and the symbols are changing. And it's only thanks to your sort of mathematical knowledge that your senses, you don't know because you can't speak this language, but your senses, um, they're counting down. Oh, okay. Um, oh, no. <laughs> and you would also find inside one of the furnaces um, a set of journals, a set of books, burnt. Um, with that, I would probably run to Spencer with this thing yeah. because he might be more knowledgeable than I am. Um, and there's a definitely a sense of urgency. You <laughs> can figure this out. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they're burnt to a crisp, right? Like, uh, you would just, you would need... Uh, okay, so the journals are not readable? Okay. Yeah. Well, what about the, the box, like the symbols on the box? Mm. Yeah, do I recognize any of those? Um I think that with Spencer's knowledge, yeah, he would recognize them from certain occult tomes, and he would be able to confirm that they are, in fact, counting down. The good news or bad news, you don't know, is that um, it's going to take a very, very long time for them okay. to be done counting down. We're talking thousands of years. Now, at this point, after so you've explored for a while, probably I, as Keeper, would um, signal... Uh, the need to sort of move on to the Zodiac Hall through a trumpeting sound. Doesn't sound like a trumpet exactly, but that's the closest sound. Um, if, if you would imagine an animal making a trumpet-like sound, that's what you're hearing coming from the Zodiac Hall. Yes, we would follow. And uh, in the Zodiac Hall, on the map, you can sort of see that there's this half circle. Um, and that is an area encased in a curtain floor-to-ceiling curtain, very big, um, that's all around it. Uh, that said, from beneath the curtain, you can see thick cables, thick cords um, of rubber um, coming out from whatever is behind the curtain and going up to the North Tower as well as the um, South Tower. <laughs> is following a similar... Um path if there's a stick or something around <laughs> that I can from a distance open these curtains that would be my preferred method it to investigate. So, it works so well for Spencer. <laughs> Falling back on D D training, I'm gonna, I'm gonna yeah. have my lightning gun. I'm gonna ready my lightning gun actually. Ah, very nice. <laughs> um yeah so so revealing it uh the keeper might make some kind of loud noise to signify the thump that you hear against the glass tank that is on the uh, other side. It's filled with a purplish gas that does look mm. similar to uh, Spencer, what you recall um, studying coming out of uh, Adamar Osterman back in Chicago. Um, it's difficult to see inside. You keep seeing parts of whatever is in there, but the parts don't make much sense. There's the trumpeting sound, there's a tentacle, there's a human hand that thumbs up against the glass, then disappears again. And in front of this glass tank, there is a complicated control panel. Uh, imagine sort of a steampunk set of uh, levers and dials and buttons, uh, all of them flashing, doing who knows what. But it's clear that those big tubes are going into the tank with whatever this thing is, right? Um, you'd have to make sanity rolls at this point if you think um, you would uh, go mentally unstable. You can you can play that out. Um, but otherwise, how would you proceed? Um, I would investigate the panel closer just to see if there is any sense that I can figure out from what does what without touching things at sure. the moment. Um, I, think, I think while she's doing science at it, I will trace the cables to the North Tower. Okay. So Dr. Sung, um, you can figure out how to turn this thing off. Okay. So, so you could turn it off, which you think would probably release the thing. You're not quite sure what releasing the thing would mean. It does. Right? Because yeah. is there a thing in there? Would it dissipate? Or would there be a physical thing that like comes out? You're not sure, but you do have the power to turn it off if you so wish. Another thing that you're going to notice, um, Dr. Song, 
as you're investigating this panel, uh, you find yourself going um, somewhat lethargic. Uh, in mechanical, game mechanical terms, you would be losing um, a couple of magic points. And uh, given your study, you would find uh, a horn. Um, imagine um, uh, an old record player, right? The, the big horn from which the sound yeah. comes out. That's, you find that, and looking very closely at it, you will see that there is something coming out of the horn. Um, floating through the air are symbols, formula. They are going in a stream from this machine past you, back through the East Corridor, back through the entrance hall, as far as you know, all the way to the other side of the observatory and the big observatory dome at its, uh, at its top. So that's another thing that you will uh, discover. <laughs> Meanwhile, uh, Spencer, you would go into the North Tower. You would find a conical device matching the description of Dr. Osterman's um, creation. Oh. And you would cool. see that the big tubes go into said device. That's the normal thing that's here. The abnormal thing is that this device from a gemstone situated at the top of its pyramidal structure is um, it's casting an image like a projector. That image shows the woman that you saw in the portrait, Ursula Kreutz. She is sitting in what appears to be the center of the tower that you are in right now. So she, in this projection, is where the device is. She holds before her a silver key. And she seems to be, as far as uh, you know from your, from your background, um, speaking an incantation, conducting some kind of ritual. And depending on what skill roles you succeeded in, you would even be able to tell um, that she was mentioning the words Uma Attavil, the most ancient and prolonged of life, as well as its master, Yok Sothoth, the all in one. What would Spencer do at this point? Um, so he would put a couple of things together um, and go check out the South Tower. Okay, or so what he, remains would, he, would, of it. he would leave. Right. Because okay. in his in his mind, right, he's thinking we haven't seen uh was it Walter was the was the yeah. brother? Uh we haven't seen Walter, right? So uh, he's putting things together with a cult thinking like, okay, if she's trapped in a time loop, maybe they were doing a simultaneous ritual with another version of the device in the other tower and it blew up. Mm. So as Spencer was leaving uh this North Tower I would uh, probably give him a listener roll to hear the sound <laughs> of... Um, Ursula Kreutz will have stopped speaking. Maybe she's now whispering. Um, but you actually hear the sound of someone strangling. Oh, okay. So that would then catch, catch his attention. Um, he would turn back to the image. And he would uh, see Walter Kreutz standing behind his sister and choking her by pulling on the necklace chain. Oh, that's bad. Do I hear choking as well? Like it's strangling? Too far. Nope. Too um, far. Okay. And the machine that you are in front of is making noise as well. Wow. Sort of a hum and then the trumpets. So, yeah, this would just be Spencer would have to decide what, if anything, he was going to do here. Yeah. So is there is there um, a thing to do or is it just like observe and be disturbed by the show? Well, like, is um, there is the, there something the image to is coming from the device. And, um, I mean, it's, it's casting this projection. Um, I don't know if you would want to experiment with it in any way. Yeah, uh, I mean, you know, he is, he is uh, evil Spencer, so he's, he's going to take some risks here. Uh, he's going to run his hand through it like you would in a, in a hologram, kind of. Um, yeah, your hand would go through the wall. Oh. Yeah, I mean, Ooh. imagine that you're, like, reaching into a computer screen. Okay. And then you're seeing a digital image of your hand. Yep. Okay. And if and, I pull uh, it back, we'll see oh, something as well. So he will see something. You're not sure whether it's your hand or whether it's all of you, um, but it uh, causes him to speed up his efforts to murder his sister. 
in the interest of how often do you get to do this, I'm going to try to, to reach in further, possibly even jump or fall in um, to prevent this murder, thereby abandoning my evil label. I'll have to shave the goatee later. But um, yeah, try to get in there and prevent this, this murder. Yeah, absolutely. You would jump in. Um, Dr. Song. Okay. I would probably follow to the North Tower and just check up on Spencer and be like, hey, what did you find? And then stumble into the room. <laughs> yeah, I imagine you would step into the room, it would be as described, and you would see Spencer and Walter Kreutz wrestling in this projection on the wall um, while Ursula Kreutz is like gasping, trying to get back her breath. I may or may not be able to do a role for this, but I'm wondering, like, I knew that turning off the machine might release what's ever in the tank. Do I have any indication what it might do to this hologram? Uh, it would make it go away, you think? Make it go away? Well, that's not exactly what I want to do at this point. Um, I'm going to reach in and try and, like, see if I can grab Spencer out of the hologram. Okay. Um, Spencer, would you let yourself be saved or would you, what are you trying to accomplish now that you are at some point in time wrestling with Walter Kreutz, the man who you saw in the portrait and who you heard about from Adama Osterman? Yeah, I mean, I think I'm going to attempt to subdue him, right? I'm no, I'm no slouch in the fisticuffs department. Mm. Um, so I think I want to, I want to try to, you know, give him a, a roughing up between that and the intimidate and let him know that, that he's got to, you know, he's going to sit and talk to me. Okay. Uh, he's going to, he's going to spill, he's going to spill his guts. All right. Um, while that goes on, <laughs> Ursula would come through the projection. Okay. Ah! <laughs> and shortly thereafter, as the fight continues between Spencer and uh, Walter Kreutz, um, there would be a spark from the uh, uh, pyramidal machine smell of smoke and then the projection would flicker and be gone along with spencer and walter <laughs> okay poor dr song she keeps getting abandoned oh man uh, <laughs> oh yeah, yeah really poor, do poor dr song that's yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, i'm concerned about myself here <laughs> <laughs> so you have ursula now with you from the past a uh, NPC who is uh, pretty mentally disturbed by all of this, but who would be able to share through appropriate skill roles that um, she and her brother were working on a device with Adamar Osterman. And that they okay. succeeded in as much as something came through and took over her brother. Okay. What was their original goal with the device? They were trying to walk between dimensions. Okay. And um, so she can she can disclose that she was in the process of trying to conduct a ritual to free her brother from this malign presence um, when he came upon okay. her to murder her. Okay, got it. Um, so I would probably, through a series of questions, just try and find out as much information as I can about the device, how it works, if she knows how the panel works, and ultimately with the goal of trying to say, how do we get to your brother and Spencer? Like, how do we fix this? Yeah, so she would not recognize um, the machinery uh, that you were just looking at um, in the Zodiac Hall. Um, it, this would all be kind of uh, technology from after her time. So, you know, more recent to you, not not to her. Um, so she would find that confusing. She would not quite understand what the thing is in there. She'd probably fail another sanity roll and, and uh, go temporarily insane. Um, yeah. And that might cause her to um, run to the western side of the observatory where she will think her brother is and she will call out um brother i'm coming you know hold on don't do anything rash and she may have connected some dots that you would not have yet um i would just follow her i don't want her out of my sight because she, i feel like she's my anchor to yeah. whatever's happening yeah so you would um you would reach the west hall there would be a staircase uh going up and on that staircase would be Spencer. Hooray! It would be it would be uh, a new iteration of Spencer. Dreadlocks this time. Dreadlocks. Spencer with dreadlocks. <laughs> um, but he would be frozen on the stairs. 
So he would be like in the process of going up them. And Dr. Sung, through um, roles, through watching Ursula start to run up the stairs, you would see her begin to slow. And you would realize that Spencer was moving, but infinitesimally slow. Okay. Oh, geez. Um, okay, so I would not go up the staircase. Yep. And, and you would, um, again, be reminded of, like, the stream of particles that is coming. And sure enough, like, it's going up the stairs um, to the uh, equatorial room, is what these big observatory rooms are called. Uh, she is luckily in a state of... I, I'm i so... In, this is chaotic. I don't know what's happening. This is far outside of my studies, anything I've ever experienced. Um, I'm going to go turn off the machine. Okay. So you would turn off the machine, and uh, we would hear, or we might sort of flash back, uh, to Spencer going up the stairs. Uh, Spencer, you'll still have your lightning gun? Still still have that um, in, in, this, uh, in this reality? Um, the bad news for you, Dr. Sung, is turning off the device, the purple smoke is beginning to dissipate. And now the tentacled monstrosity that is inside is pounding against the glass. And it's not immediately breaking through, but you can see hairline fractures beginning to form. I was going to ask if this uh, room had a door that was lockable <laughs> that I could run out and then... Yeah, the door into the East Corridor. You could close it, you could lock it. Okay, you that go would through, be my goal. Everyone yells, surprise! <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, thank you for running through <laughs> um, Spencer, you uh, would find yourself going up the equatorial room stairs, and you would recall that um, you had come into uh, the observatory. You had explored, you had seen some of the things that your former self saw. Um, but rather than go into the projection, you did not do that. You just walked away. Right, uh, and now you're you're going up the stairs. Um, Ursula, we're going to say, is with Doctor Song, that she managed to like turn around before getting stuck in whatever time trap uh, you found yourself in. Um, but uh, you go into the observatory. Yeah, why not? All right. As far so, as I know, that's the next natural thing. Yeah. So at this point, uh, Spencer would trigger sort of the climax of the scenario. And in the observatory room, if you look at the very end of our table read document, you would see what the um, observatory, the equatorial room looks like, along with this telescope that has been repurposed uh, into something else. And researching this, I thought this was so cool. Um, I didn't know how these rooms worked. But they're elevators. They are massive elevators. The entire floor uh -huh. can raise and lower around the telescope. That way you can adjust the telescope, right, to reach different different areas. Um, and uh, so you can see the tower in this image. You can just see a little uh, Walter Kreutz there. He is uh, working this device. This device which is releasing this stream of light into the sky. So the observatory dome is open, not destroyed, it's just open. And the stream of light is uh, going up into the sky where you can see it uh, coalesce around a particular point, almost like um, a portal that is opening. Walter Kreutz would not notice you when you came in because the sound of the machine is incredibly loud. But around Walter Kreutz, would be these energy fields that you could see, three deep. So much like the um, symbols that Dr. Song <laughs> saw, those would be circling around Walter Kreutz and the telescope, or what was a telescope and has now been recreated into some sort of portal gun. Um, and so those things would be a barrier between you and Kreutz. Yeah, I mean, I would look to see if, if anything was generating them. So you look around and you see three of these pyramidal devices, uh, similar to the one that you saw oh. in the North Tower. Okay, that's good. Um, so I'm going to go and like poke one or, or remove the gem or whatever seems like it, you know, interacts with it. Yeah, you would you would be able to deactivate it. You did study this device previously. Um, in fact, you probably heard it malfunction um, in in a parallel life. Uh, so you could turn it off, and sure enough, one of those. Um, uh, force fields would dissipate. One one machine down, one barrier goes down. 
my my spiritual memory suggests very strongly not to walk into mm. glowing things. Um, but I do want to get Walter's attention, which is why I turned the barrier off. Okay, yeah, and um, you can you can easily shout up to him, and he will uh, turn around, and you will see his eyes sort of bulging. He is um, not looking well. Uh, he is he is okay, looking he like well. uh, like a madman, right? He is incredibly stressed out, um, emaciated, and uh, flabbergasted uh, to see you here. Uh, but meanwhile, yeah. what's Doctor Song doing? Um. Going to check on Spencer. So after I turn off the machine, I'm like, all right, is he still frozen or moving very, very, very slowly or what's happening? Spencer's gone. Yes. Yeah, and the uh, door to the equatorial room is open. I would go in there. And Walter Kreutz would not notice you immediately. Ursula is with you. I um, would turn to Ursula and just say, save your brother. Like, do what you need to do. Save him. Okay. And so at this point, you would, um, through... Uh, acting through her, in a sense, and making appropriate social roles, you could try and uh, kind of control or stimulate how she communicates with her brother. And what you will learn from the interaction between the two is Walter Kreutz is trying to summon something that will forever destroy the entities that took him over. He will He will rant something along the lines of, can't you see what I'm trying to do? Don't you understand that they have to be stopped? That they are waiting in their black towers, waiting for us to die so they can rise again? They will sacrifice you, just like they sacrificed my sister. They will make sacrifices of you all. Depending on how your roles go then, Walter Kreutz will either be talked down from the edge, or not. <clears throat> There's a number of ways that this uh, scenario can uh, resolve. If you successfully talk him down, there is a peaceful route here where, uh, although unlikely, um, he can shut down the device, it's not too late, and uh, that's sort of the happiest ending that you can have. More likely, uh, one of a couple of things happens. Right? Walter Kreutz succeeds, and a portal opens up above you, um, or you successfully disrupt Walter Kreutz and the device starts going out of control. Let's have you go with one of those two options. Which do you prefer? Successfully um, disrupting Kreutz or letting Kreutz continue or having him continue? I've made friends with Ursula and she was my first point of contact for like what was happening. So I would uh, want to disrupt Walter. Okay. So if you disrupt it, you can imagine this telescopic portal gun going out of control and its beam getting pushed off uh, where it had been centered. This could happen in any number of ways, right? You could tackle Walter Kreutz, you could disable the device, because uh, it's a tower, right? So you could go into the tower and disrupt the machinery. Um, you could sort of shoot Kreutz from a distance. You could use the elevator, move it up, and force the telescope out of position, right? Lots of different skill roll options for, for you to explore here. Um, but at the end of it, Portal would go out of control, and uh, the building would start to come apart as the beam... Uh, tour through rocks. There would start to be an earthquake as the portal above you um, started to expand very quickly. It's at this point that we realize why this is so clearly a one-shot, aside from all the deaths that have already happened, because we would have uh, Yorg Sothoth, like emerge through the portal. Um, excellent. Excellent, right? And actually, um, depending on how long the conflict in here goes on, you actually have these kind of soap bubbles coming through the portal to create uh, intermediate obstacles, right? And looking into them would be an opportunity to see the scariness that you saw um, in, your, in your parallel lives, in the dream, for example. Um, but we would then do a, uh, a chase scene or rather an escape scene, whereby uh, we would have a set of cards that the scenario comes with of all the locations of the observatory. And so you would be moving from one room to another, trying to escape the observatory before the whole building came apart. Or before, you know, that elder god expanded to such an extent that it just swallowed you up. Another possibility 
uh, we've talked about sort of the peaceful, right? You talk Walter Kreutz down. Um, we've talked the it goes out of control. Um, the the least likely, at least in the playthroughs I've done, is that Kreutz tries to escape through the portal. And there's actually a possibility of you chasing him through kind of the multiverse, if you will, um, eventually ending up uh, at, at a Yithian city. A lot of different ways that uh, this climax can play out, but either, you know, peaceful talking down or a couple of different types of chase scenes with cards um, would sort of be the universe of, of likely possibilities. So uh, assuming you escaped, right, the observatory would be destroyed. Maybe you would have Ursula with you still. Maybe she would uh, be, remain a contact. Walter, probably not. Um, but that would then uh, conclude the scenario. Very cool. Would it, was, it, was it clear that, that letting him do what he wanted to do was a bad thing? Yeah, in the lore of the scenario, right, this is one of those, um, the investigators are going to have a very hard time understanding um, what he's trying to do. Um, although if you were to fix the journals, and you could fix the journals in a couple of ways, right, there's the orrery room that actually has a device that can turn back time for particular objects, so you could restore them. Um, had you uh, played around with the uh, East Corridor and those projectors and seen if like maybe you held the journal up to a projector um, it might have uh, shown you its original and that would have um, more clearly detailed that Walter, Ursula, Adamar, all friends they succeeded and a Yithian came through and possessed Walter Kreutz. He then constructed mm. the rest of the observatory um, but was a Yithian, right? He was doing what Yithians do when they take us over. They were spending five years having his mind removed and, and in some distance place. And so um, Ursula was trying to save him. Uh, but as you saw, Walter, or the Yithian controlling Walter, ultimately killed her. So you can imagine when Walter eventually came back into himself, regained his memories, regained control of his body, to find out that five years had passed and his sister was dead was not a good was not a good time and so Walter devoted himself to trying to find a way to destroy the Yithians which um, canonically uh, as we know is um, uh, where the flying polyps come in the uh, otherwise known as the oh, yeah, right, right, right. thing that uh, crushed the outside uh, of the uh, uh, the the car outside the oh, yeah. um so you know we had this sort of complicated idea of pitting one eldritch creature race against another and that's what he was trying to do it, it, more or less right how much of it he realized is is open for debate um but i think we stuck pretty close to an hour there yeah we did good let's yep. let's take a couple of of grace minutes then and see what you all thought yeah, so I um, I liked there's a couple of spot things that I liked. Um, I liked the uh, during the the dream at the beginning, getting the players to suggest what their tragedies were. Um, I thought that was nice. That's something that increasingly I think that I'm trying to do when I run a game is to is to get the players to get more ownership over their characters and their backstories. Um, and as you correctly pointed out, that also gives you things to hurt them with later um which you know i explicitly tell my players now i'm like give me something that i can use against you it's going to be fun and they're like okay great so this is a, it's you're right it's a very ambitious uh scenario it requires probably as a keeper it requires probably two read throughs before you play it it's uh scary for a new keeper because you've got to be quick on your toes um structurally um, I think you'd made the right call in setting up essentially a haunted house. And I think that's the best because for the keeper, it's, it's, you have all of your notes that you need, right? You don't have to redirect players. You know what, where they can go and what they can do. So you can focus on refreshing your knowledge of what your options there, right? Like I got, as a player, I got a little bit hung up on what was going on. I'm not sure how much that matters because I think we're getting used to not needing to know what's going on. Yeah, and there's lots more handouts that we didn't get into that, that provide more of that that background. Okay. But you are absolutely right that um, this is not a scenario for first-time keepers to run. Right, This was the third scenario I wrote for the Miskatonic Repository, and I recall wanting to increase in complexity with each scenario um, because we always hear about scenarios that are great for beginners, right? Oh, this is a great introduction to Call of Cthulhu. And I wanted to make a scenario that was not that, 
right? A scenario <laughs> that was like, if you are a fan of the lore, if you have read the stories, there's going to be a lot of, not even Easter eggs, right? Just stuff that you will, as a player, recognize. Your investigator won't, but you will sort of have the, the delight of, of seeing that play out. Leslie? In terms of what I think is a really, what stood out to me that could be a good fit for people is um, lots of sanity loss opportunity. So if you like to have some craziness at your table, this would be a really great scenario for that. People who love time travel or parallel universe kind of, they just like those kind of stories. This is gonna be a really great fit for that. And then the other things that stood out to me is um, it was really good at building tension. So it was like ratcheting up every time the creepy weird things going on. I love seeing myself in the different areas of the scenario. That was great. And then the death cards as well of it, you might die, but you're not really dead. You're you're going to come back like that's going to be OK for the keeper. Um, other than being um, maybe a more advanced keeper, like something to keep in mind is how to pace seeing yourselves in those areas so like when to sprinkle in those opportunities how you can build the atmosphere i think are key things to keep in mind as you're reading through the scenario yeah i think uh what what we saw very nicely in this kind of speed run is um all the things that the scenario attempts right um i, th I think the scenario illustrates uh, one of the things that I, as as a creator, was trying to do, which is um, maybe it's it's good, maybe it's not, uh, but it's interesting. Uh, and so we have a lot of interesting ideas from the death cards that uh, Leslie mentioned to the parallel universe to um, all the rooms have different kind of traps and ways to interact with them, right? And uh, in playthroughs, I have seen everything from... Um, a player playing two versions of themselves, one a sort of crazy capitalist and one uh, a crazy socialist, right? Because that's how uh, the death cards worked out. Um, I've seen folks running from the Yithian as it smashes through the glass. You saw uh, sort of rescuing Ursula and having her as a tool that you can use uh, when confronting Kreutz. Just a lot of wonderful hilarity that can ensue, a lot of levers uh, that you're able to pull um, and, uh, and have things yeah come out in in very different ways so uh, thank you for joining us for this this was a new format love you to share your thoughts in the comments below um as well as whether you found this helpful in deciding if this scenario is right for your table and what about the design ideas of this scenario is there anything that speaks to you or that is similar to what you've tried or might want to try well we look forward to hearing from you and as always until then stay tuned for more